Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 132, Non-Traditional Hockey Teaching, with Barry Karn and Karn Skating Dynamics, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we take another non-traditional lap ski around the rink with one of the most respected skating development pioneers, Barry Karn, and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to sweethockeycoach.com, that's sweethockeycoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. Today is a real treat for me, as I love when I can have our next guest, skating instructor extraordinaire, Barry Karn, on the show. He's one of our most popular guests here on the Hockey Journey podcast. After you're done with this episode, you can also check out number 12, 78, and 79 for a whole lot more of Barry Karn goodness. Recently, one of my other companies, OnlineHockeyTraining.com, started posting again on the Ticker Talk the Instagrammer, YouTube, and the Facebook, to mention a few, after a good two-year break. One category I like to highlight is the opposite hand training I have players work on and the benefits, but wanted a different, more catchy title, and then I remembered something Mr. Karn said, disagreeable training. I texted him, asking if he'd mind if I'd use the term. He proceeded to give me one of the longest texts I've ever received on disagreeable training and how it's such a critical ingredient in a kid's childhood development. Whew! Right then and there, I said, it's been too long. I don't know what the topic is going to be, but I need to get a little Barry Karn fix. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're ready to brave this trip with me here today, soon to be traveling through uncharted waters, we'll sit back, get comfy, settle in, Put your trade table in its upright and locked position. Buckle up. Five, four, three, two, one. Here we go. Barry Karn, welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Happy to be here. I'm hanging on tight. This should be good. (laughs) It's going to be awesome. Um, How long do you think it's been since the last time you were on the show? Oh, I don't know. Was that... Me, I don't think it's been a year, but it was. I, I, I'm guessing maybe last spring, last summer. I, I don't remember. It's been, uh, it's been December of 22. It was right before Christmas of 22, the end of 22. Oh, wow. Okay. So, a lot longer than I thought. Well, you had a concussion along the way, so you know, it's understandable. We'll, we'll talk right. about that a little later. That so. throws a couple of dates out the window, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, uh, so happy to have you on the show. So, as a couple of days ago, I still had no idea what we we're going to talk about uh, here today. Uh, the disagreeable training, I'm always, you know, it's how, how are we going to give to people? What are we going to offer them that's going to benefit them? So, um, I had a lesson on Monday, as I still didn't know, with the Zumwinkles, who we both uh, have been working with for for years. Uh, Grace, or Emily, she plays for the Gophers, and Grace, she plays uh, for the women's, the professional women's team here in Minnesota. And side note, by the way, if I go, if I try to search the PWHL and hit it, it said, the website never pops up. So anyone who's connected with that league or that website, uh, get it. Cause I want to start having a, you know, once a week have someone from, uh, that league on the show. So sorry for ranting. Let's go back to the question. So I had the, 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 um, the Zumwinkles in and I just said, you know, if you could describe in a few words, Barry and Jody Karn and Karn skating dynamics, you know, what would you say? 
And Grace said something that I instantly knew was going to be the foundation for today's episode. Non-traditional hockey training and teaching. So um, I'm like, perfect. So I'm just going to throw that question out. Why the heck would she say that? And what does that mean to you? And speak for both you and uh, Jody and uh, your kids, too, because I think they work with the company now as well. Yeah, I think uh, I, that's kind of interesting. I, I I chuckled when I heard that because I've always sort of thought of myself as a little bit of a, a wing nut, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so when I start, I first started doing this, um, you know, I was sort of I was out of hockey. I got injured young, and I was out of hockey. And my wife was a figure skater, and we went on a skating date. <laughs> okay, and she started. She's like, what are you doing that for? Why don't you try this? You know, all that kind of thing. And my skating date turned into, you know, sweaty armpits and, you know, ripped jeans and whatever. It was like turned into a training session. And I was so intrigued by it. It was just fun. And she was an unbelievable skater. And she made all these things look really easy. And they all just sort of made sense to me. And, um, you know, so it was we I got into it in sort of a weird way, right? I was I was playing hockey and then I was out because of a, a bad concussion and doctors were like, you should never play again. And I think I probably could play now, but I wouldn't be who I am if I had. So it was, uh, you know, that's that's water under the bridge. And so anyway, the date turned into that. And then we actually got married not too long. after. I actually asked her to marry me 10 days after we met. I just knew it. And uh, we were pretty young. Um, started having kids right away and and uh, she was teaching figure skating at the time and she was a highly uh, accomplished figure skater too so she was she was very good she was teaching figure skating and she had all these little kids calling for lessons all the time like hey can my, my brother wants to take lessons and she didn't want she's like I don't want to teach boys and I'm like, hey, I'll go out there and be a hockey player and carry a stick and wear wear gloves and move cones and pucks for you. And she goes, and she's like, pucks? We're going to have pucks out there? She was scared to death of pucks, right? So yeah. we we started doing that, and I was so into it. I was uh, I was looking at skating technique stuff everywhere I could find it. And back then, it was sort of pre-internet, so it was videos, you know, looking at video libraries and things like that. And just trying to soak up as much as I could. Cause I, when I got out on the ice, it just felt like heaven. Cause it had been a couple of years and I was a little bitter. Um, and I, I wasn't watching any hockey. I wasn't doing anything early eighties. I missed a lot of Gretzky. And, uh, so I, I, but then I got on the ice and I just somehow felt like, wow, I belong here. This is, this really feels good. And, um, so I said, why don't we do a clinic? And, and this was one year we just got these kids together who's the figure skating or figure skating students, friends, and some of their friends, we did a clinic and we had a big, we had kind of a big, uh, a big response to it and was able to, we were able to do another one. We thought, Hey, this would be a great little thing we do every summer, a clinic or two, you know, and it just kept growing and growing and growing. And, because I wasn't ever really around power skating or anything like that, I was in my own little lab, my own little, uh, you know, crazy scientist lab, kind of working on things going, you know, this seems to work better than that. Let's do this and that and watching skaters and why is this skater, why does the skater seem to be able to generate so much speed with so much less aggression and power than that person? and then. What if you took that guy and you gave him some aggression and power? You know, what do you have then? And so we, we ended up working on this model that I had no idea was necessarily non-traditional. And this was way back in the mid 80s. Uh, we've been doing this for about 40 years now. And, and it was way back. And people thought I was crazy. And now they now they know I'm crazy. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, we started doing things that were a little bit different. and. I was around when the when power skating first started in the early 70s, um, you know, with the guy who called it power skating, Dick Vera, who was just a genius. And he had he was doing some he was doing some, uh, you know, he was he called it power skating and he was working with the Minnesota North Stars. And 
And then he started having guys show up at lessons in the in the mid to late eighties. And uh, you know, it'd be a really fast skater. And he's going, Yeah, you know, I'm gonna teach him this power skating start, let's say, you know, get up on your toes, jump over the hockey sticks, whatever. And I'm gonna teach him that, and we're gonna make this really fast guy just like superhuman. And all of a sudden he found out he slowed him down. He slowed him down almost 20%. And so he started to change too to non-traditional type things. And unfortunately he had passed away at kind of a prime time in his life. But I, I, I remember talking to him and just thinking, I love this guy. He just had a great demeanor about him and he was really detail oriented, but he had already started changing, but yet the book had already been written. And I learned a little bit about what he was changing to. And I was sort of already in that kind of that realm of the glide platform training for, for hockey players. And so I started just, it was sort of, it validated that I might be onto something. And so we started doing more and more and more of it. And we're timing kids all the time. And we always, it, it was like, we never had an exception to the rule of this, new thing we were doing it was always something that made somebody faster more aggressive or not more faster more agile uh better balanced be able, able to use their biomechanics better on the ice more efficient you know so therefore it took a lot more for them to get their heart rate really high they, they could play at a at a relatively calm uh in a relatively calm demeanor more you know not not that they never had to hustle or anything but they were just more efficient so we started doing that and then you know this that's me in my little lab and then uh way back this is in the mid 90s uh bobby smith was uh he was a minnesota north star he had just this yeah. phenomenal hands like he had this huge range of motion with his stick handling it was always so fascinating to me and i ran into him just playing hockey at this place called lewis park it was a giant bandy rink and hockey players would show up from all over the place and just play hockey and so there'd be bobby smith and a bunch of other pro guys and whatever and we just play a uh you play like four on four and it would turn into six on six and eight on eight and ten on ten you know how that goes and yeah. then uh, a bunch of younger kids would show up and we were done and uh, and I remember just sitting around talking to him and he had some boys and they were taking they were skating in Eden Prairie at the time. And he goes, he go, I go, geez, I wish I had your hands. And he goes, you know, I wish I had your legs. He goes, what do you you skate so fluidly and differently? What is that all about? And I said, hey, I'll come and do a team clinic for your kids. And so we went, I went and did a couple for both of his, uh, his kids teams. And he said, Hey, uh, I'm the GM for, for Phoenix now, you know, it was the first year they moved down to Phoenix. And he said, could you do a camp? And he said, we'll do it in Minnesota. And so we did that. And that was my first pro experience. And that was my first time being in the lab around other people who were very learned around the game of hockey you know the, the, the nhl coaches the trainers yeah. the all these people that are around this system and literally going up to me going what the hell are you talking about yeah. and i've never heard that before and and some of them are like i've never heard that before it must be wrong <laughs> yeah. know, that kind of thing which is you know we can all get like that right hey i've yeah. never done it like that that can't be right and um so but but we, the results spoke for themselves because, you know, in camp, there's timing for everything. And we had this, uh, literally, it was the dumbest thing ever. It was the guys were like at the goal line. They had to see how many, if they could, how many times they could go from the goal line to the blue line in whatever amount of minutes. And it was, it was way beyond anything a hockey player should ever train for, right? It was just this long marathon of a thing. And so I had a guy down there. I said, listen, no matter what, don't do this and you'll probably do well. And he broke the record, the like the, the, the record by a long shot. And all it was was a uh, it was a posture thing. I said, you know, you start getting tired and you start bending over. I don't care if your knees, if your legs get almost straight, don't bend over, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And he blew the thing away by like 25 percent, which was like six different, you know, six laps more than the, the person before. And so I started to get an idea about what efficiency was. And then 
they're uh they're timing things the the uh strength coaches they had some correlations between wind gate and on ice endurance too and the guy who won was like middle of the pack on his wind gate test so his vo2 wow. was nowhere near what his test results showed and so i i that kind of changed things a lot because a lot of those guys then started moving around and I got a little bit of a reputation for that. And the same type of things would happen with, with, uh, you know, like one of the last teams that I work with, with the sharks and I was out there and the head of scouting is, is going, we don't, we don't know what he's talking about. Cause I was mic'd up and they were up in the, up in the, uh, uh, suite listening. And they're, we don't know what he's talking about. Can you, can we have a meeting and, you know, like a Q and a, and so they set up this 20 minute little question and answer thing. And nobody there except for Jimmy Johnson, who, you know, knew yeah. what I was doing. So we, we sat in there and it was supposed to be this 20 minute thing, but it lasts two and a half hours. So these guys were asking all these questions because there were so many things that were different and so many things that they, they believed to be true that were really already disproven. And so that's, I think, why uh, people will call it unconventional because it's not normally what they hear. But I think it's 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 fast becoming a standard. Um, you know, we've talked about this before, like a traditional power skating technique uh, will get about one out of 300 skaters up to their running speed and everybody else will be slower. And if that's a pro, that's going to be around 22, 21, 22 miles an hour. And now you have a guy who can run, I think, 21 and a half miles an hour in Connor McDavid, who can hit 29 miles an hour on his skates. So there's a vast difference between what used to be taught and what the, the fastest skaters in the world do. And so I think that's where the unconventional comes. And then maybe the other thing is I'm just a weird guy. I tell a lot of stupid <laughs> jokes and try and keep people sort of in an upbeat mood while they're trying to learn things that are just really tough. So, so I know that anytime as a teacher, you can back up what you're saying with science, you know, or statistics, something that, you know, it's already been proven, then, you, you know, you get instant credibility. So, I mean, that, that had to have been, um, exciting to know you got you got something in your pocket that you know no one's seen before and you're gonna have to sell it because you know i was part of that league when uh you know it still has it you know the good old boys and you just this is how we do things around here son you know kind of thing <laughs> yeah and, yep. you know you got to be brave to do that so uh hats off to you for taking that challenge um, do you think that this off what popped in my head, do you think that there's been, you know, similar significant leaps since the, you know, the eighties, early nineties, since all, when you, you know, were getting all this stuff. And by the way, I, I'm looking at your website right now, 1984. I, I'm just thinking, I think Met Center, it was either Van Halen or Bob Seger. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Right. So. <laughs> exactly. I was probably there too. Yeah, that's uh yeah, that's uh that yeah, that's a long time ago. And and as far as leaps go, I think the biggest leaps are the fact that more I, I mean the the biggest possible leap in just my field is that more people are aware of the difference in skating now um from the old school skating. Because skating is skating the the old school skating was really based on uh on a flaw uh, with young, weak skaters. And, and the thing is, uh, you know, even like the pro guys, there were guys in the early 70s smoking between periods, right? Or, or they would be <laughs> like, you even talk to Gretzky and, and he's like, hey, uh, we got training camp in two weeks. I better start jogging and doing some push-ups, right? And that's <laughs> it. And so, you know, there, it was a different, the guys didn't have anywhere near the power to weight ratio that they have now. And the skates were really flimsy and everything. And if you take somebody who doesn't have super strong legs, they're going to pitch over forward to get their stick to the ice. They're going to be biomechanically in a bad position. They're not going to be able to stay on glide. 
Um, their lateral movement won't be there. And then you get this freaky guy like Paul Coffey, who actually stiffened his skates before anybody ever did that, had them all built up so they were stiffer. And he had really wide feet, so you could handle maybe a softer skate, that kind of thing. And he had, and he was, he conditioned. You know, he did he did a bunch of leaping and, you know, strength work back then that was unheard of. And so everybody was like, how does this guy skate like this? How, how can this be possible? Why is he so much faster? Why is he so much more efficient and things like that? And so he changed, you know, he, he changed a lot of things, too. But people just thought, OK, he's a freak. We don't know how to copy that. And, and now we do. Now we know how to copy it. We know how to make our athletes three to four times stronger than they used to be. They get way more ice time than they used to be. The, the, uh, the training for hockey is year round. You know, like, you know, it obviously backs off during the season. You take a couple weeks off after the season and then you get right back into it because you can't play without that, without that inhuman strength anymore. So I think basically what's happened is there's just that many more people like we have close to 230 guys in the NHL now that have done our training and we've had a total of almost 500 and since since 96 when I started working with the Coyotes and and so there's just tons of guys out there and you know they tell their friends and they tell their friends and they come into town or I see them in agency camps and things like that and so there's way more guys out there and they've sped up the game and and I think those those kind of guys, the guys who get a hold of good strength training and skating training and training like like what you have, that's why the league is younger now. For, they're just they're growing up with that kind of stuff, you know, right away at the age that they can strength train. They are. And and there's just much more sophisticated skating training and stick handling training and uh, you know, video coaching and tactical training and all the different things, uh, sports psychologists, all that kind of stuff. And so these kids are getting that younger. And I think it's it's actually made the league younger. Yeah. Um, God, there's so many directions. We're going to go this direction right now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, I, I get going. I can't stop. So you can just push the buzzer if it's getting too long. No, no, I, I love it. Because I, I've had, a, you know, I took a few notes on what I, you know, might come up. But um, one of the things that you just talked about, just on how many different puzzle pieces are on the table for players to access besides just playing for, you know, going to their team games and practices, you know, yeah. the extra ice in the morning and stuff like that. So. We just had the Minnesota State High School boys and girls uh, tournament here in Minnesota, and uh, just one of the most iconic and most successful youth hockey and uh, high school programs, the Edina Hornets. Uh, they both they won the state tournament for both the the boys and girls high school, and I actually went through. Every level of the state tournaments, uh, boys and girls, and I gotta say, 70, 75 percent. There's an Edina team represented in the state tournaments at the youth level as well. It is unbelievable. Um, yeah, I think so. So, so two part question: One, how do they, how do they do that? How did they do that this year? And I don't, I don't think, because I don't think that that happens very often where the boys and girls went at the same uh, season. And then two, you know, you talk every once in a while, there's a team that comes down from Northern Minnesota that beats all these city teams and uh, they don't have the sports psychologists. They don't have Barry Karn up there. They don't have me up there. They don't have a ton of, you know, a lot of the extra, the, the experts, they just have ice that's available anytime, right. pretty much for anyone. And the, but what's crazy is, so my son, Rhett, who's playing for the Gophers, uh, one of his teammates, Aaron Huglin, is from Rosso, a northern, uh, northern Minnesota town. And I remember there's a big tournament at Squirt Age, age 10, called the Brick Tournament at the West Edmonton Mall. 
uh, over the uh, 4th of July weekend. And Aaron at a young age was the, the kid was, he was pretty talented. I wanted to have him on my team for that, for that uh, tournament. And I asked the parents, I, I so many times and it, it, they were like, what are you talking about? July Lance? We're, we're on the lake. We're fishing. We're, we're doing this. We're not right, playing right. hockey. So, <laughs> you know, that's kind of the, the question is how did Edina do that? And then how do these Northern places, uh, organizations, high schools and youth programs continue to pump out high, uh, end talent, uh, but they don't have the, the, the extras, uh, for getting better at hockey uh, readily available up there, like players uh, do down here in the cities. Yeah, that's a that's a question with a, a zillion answers, isn't it? Um, it? You know, the thing about the thing about like like let's just take Edina. Um, well, I, actually, let's take the northern teams. You know, you knew you remember Nancy Burgraff, right? So sure. she was uh, she was a, a skating coach, a really well known skating coach. She used to work like I think her claim to fame was University of North Dakota, and I believe it was War Road. I don't remember where her hometown was, but she did skating camps all over up there. And I think Frank, I think his name is Frank, the son, sort of took over the business at one time and. I'm not sure if he's still going on, but I'm sure there were a whole bunch of little mentored coaches up there all over. So there was some really good skating training up there. And, you know, like, and she used to work with Rozo too. So that, I think that was her hometown, I believe. Okay. So anyway, and if Frank might've played for North Dakota too. So anyway, she was a really good skating coach and like the sweetest lady. I she used to come down and be at the equipment show. And I just, I just loved sitting and talking to her because she, she, she reminded me of like, she was my mother in the skating world, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, so she, she trained a lot of people up there. So I think there's a little bit, I think there's a, actually not a little bit, I think there's a lot of wise training that is going on in some of those places. And of course, the towns aren't that big. So, you know, there's, there's some moving around where you can pull some more elite kids into a town because they're like, they have nothing where they are and they're, they're much better than that. So they want to go where the competition and the teammates are better. So there's a, there's some moving around that way. And I know that Edina, you come back down here, there's a lot of moving around that way too. I mean, the guys who grew up in Edina and were successful, they go back there. And there's a lot of pro guys, a lot of the wild guys that live there. I know there's a lot of guys from other teams. My my nephew lives over there, and uh, Van Riemsdyk lives over. There's a bunch of guys, you know, and they're all in Edina, and their kids are all playing, and they're all helping out with coaching and stuff in the summers. And then you got Bernie McBain's uh, business right in the heart of Edina there, and I think every little kid goes to that. They just get, you know, they just get all these supplemental ice times for mites you know they're normally playing on a on a saturday and sunday they're also playing on tuesday and thursday you know and they're just they're literally doubling ice time for these little kids and i think they're doing a pretty good job of uh putting some teams together and they got all this kind of stuff so anyway it ends up being a triple a organization too where the kids can play some higher end hockey and there's a lot of that up north too where they're pulling teams together like that so that's a that's a little behind the scenes type stuff. And then you have guys like Kurt Giles, who you don't see a lot of teams that can run on all cylinders like that for a whole game. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, like it's, uh, you know, cause you, you look at those guys and they're not all going on to college and they're not all going on to pro, but they played the ice, the high school game on every cylinder. And it was pretty cool to watch, to see him do that. So I think he's got a, he's, He's got a a real talent for getting under the skin and in the heads of these kids in a really good way. And uh, Sammy Reber, I I forget her last name now that she's married. She skated with me when she was a young kid or when she was younger before she went to Harvard. And she was just game face all the time, right? Sweet kid. But as soon as the drill went on, game face, worked hard, got it right. I'd see her the next time and she obviously ripped out whatever she learned. And so these are, these are people at the highest level that I think are really getting into kids' heads about, Hey, this doesn't work well for you. 
do it 75 times right now, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and get, get the ball rolling. So I think those two are, are pretty genius at what they do. And then they got that massive uh, feeder system up there too. So, I mean, that's a hard thing to say, Hey, let's copy that model because that, you know, the Edina model, they're the first hockey team in the twin cities ever. They were the Eichel started that, and the second one I think was South St. Paul, and there was like two teams down here, and that was all northern. So that's a massive tradition that's happened for a long time, and it's hard to it's hard to take the quality of the people that move back in there and coach the kids out of the equation, and like it's not important. It is, but I what I take away from that and that was very well said is uh this because my, my question is you know you when you're working for these nhl teams you know we know that you go out there once a month you're not going to make much of an impact uh right. you know you, you got to be working with these guys even if it's just 10 minutes you know a practice uh but you're you're doing that but you you said that you know it's it's transferable yeah, the coaches are getting trained, but I, I think that there there needs to be a decade or two of someone that's went through your program, had their uh, experience as a hockey player, retired, and now went back with this wealth of knowledge and starts uh, passing it on and then developing their own next version of what what's the new and improved. Uh, right. Um, and I think that that's, that's one of the key <laughs> ingredients is that, like you're saying, uh, it, it's so convenient. Everything's right there in Edina, and it, it this it's like a magnet. It just draws hockey, uh, really passionate people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and my, you know, I just got done. I can't stay up late because I get up so early in the morning. So I just got done watching the Hurricanes Rangers uh, game and. It was a one nothing game and Shesterkin stood on his head and they won and 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 they were outplayed though and uh Carolina's kind of a funny not a funny team. It's a really interesting team to watch because you know they don't have a lot of elite scoring, yet they can smother a team with their intensity and everything. Yeah. And that literally, like I remember my my uh, nephew Brady Shea he was playing for the Rangers at the time, so that one probably stung last night, but he was playing for the Rangers and came down there, you know, met Rod Brindamore and, and was like, oh, okay, just a little bit. You know, he would he had been working out with Ryan McDonough, who was a beast in the gym. And that was a wake-up call for him a little bit, too, coming out of the U, like, oh, you mean you should work this hard? And he started doing <laughs> that. Then he got down there and he went, oh, my God, Every, the, the numbers here that people are showing up here because Rod Brindamore is the coach are h way higher than where I was before. And and then you get a guy like, what is Brent Burns, 38? And he's got the highest numbers on the team. So yeah. all his VO2 and all everything. So he's, and and so Rod, of course, he likes him. And then, so what happens is now, now Brady's, you know, that's a, that's a two year process to turn in someone, turn into someone who can be a cog the way he's supposed to be in that machine. And then, and then other guys come in and then your scouting staff, is being instructed, we need motors. We want motors here um, that, you know, have some hockey sense and we can teach them how to play and blah, blah, blah. But we need motors. We need motivated people. And so that's a that's a culture right there that he's brought to that whole thing. And he's able to do it in a way where the guys really respect him. He's not beating them down. He's not a tyrant. He's just like, this is what we expect for ice time. We expect this kind of Nobody can breathe on the ice on the other team because of our unbelievably disciplined forecheck that happens everywhere on the ice and especially in their own end. So teams just have a hard time trying to function among that. You can see guys, you know, on other teams that can jump up and play against that a little bit, but rarely do you see a, a whole team that pulls that off like that all game long. And then the only thing that might get, uh, might've gotten exposed over the last couple of years is the lack of elite scoring. You know, you get a guy hurt right at the end, like the uh, Svechnikov or something like that. And then they're in a precarious place and they've just brought some guys in. So 
I'm excited to see what happens, but that's a culture situation there too that that takes time to develop. It's not like, how do I be like Rod? It's like, well, you could be like Rod, but could you be like Rod for five years in a row and watch this whole thing grow and know how to do it? It's like, well, that's a different animal right there. Well, the only way you can pull that off is if your superstars are also your your hardest workers with the most character and courage um and sure. they obviously they obviously have that and when you got Brenda Moore being the 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 head of that ship i mean it's a uh, he everyone knows what the bar is so you want yeah. to be on that team you're going to stick out like a sore thumb if you're not uh doing that so uh shifting gears here a little bit um i don't know what it was about this season and obviously it's still going for for a lot of players uh both uh the youth and and uh it's professional in college but um a lot of players had uh some challenges this year you know maybe not getting the same opportunity uh coaching challenges team challenges uh injuries and uh, you know for a lot of younger players, it, it was the first time that this wall goes up and you start getting all these different emotions that maybe you haven't had before. Uh, you had a, a pretty traumatic uh, injury. Talk a little bit about that. And then I don't know in the last time something happened to you, but you know, did that kind of shake things up for you to bring you back to a spot of uh teaching where you know okay i haven't been hurt in a long time and this is how i feel and all my brain's going crazy on how i'm going to start implementing what i'm thinking about right now uh what i'm going to do on the ice moving forward yeah i mean uh you know they say that that fear is the number one fact uh, the number one motivator for a human being and you hear people go whoa wait a minute that's not very positive it's like okay well try not being afraid of things you you should be afraid of and see how that works out for you right and so right. like those are that those are our motivators it's like you know i i just got hit right i just got hit and it's like why break it down don't like don't put it in the back of your mind like i don't ever want to have that happen again it's like, I don't want to have it happen again. What do I have to do so that it doesn't happen again? Like, is there something I can do about that? Um, you know, obviously there are things in life that just good, bad things happen to good people, a car accident, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you can't, you can't prepare for that, but there's a lot of stupid stuff that happens that, that you don't really realize where you've been stupid until it gets exposed. Right. And so, yeah, th th that's what I think that's the biggest change for me after injuries. It's like, what are you doing? You know, why, why were you doing that? Or why are you doing that? You know, and I got hurt last fall. I was just mountain biking, uh, just like, uh, caught a, caught a, like a root, and my bike, my front wheel just twisted and I just went head first into a rock and snapped my nose and this big gash on my forehead and whatever. And I'm just, you know, my butt, my brother-in-law, hey, are you okay? And I go, nope, I'm not okay. <laughs> I'm just laying there just gushing blood. And I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm probably a three, four mile walk out of the woods like that with my wife's shirt wrapped around my head like a turban and all and going to open whatever. And I'm just going, okay, I hope I make it. You know, like that kind of thing. I hope I yeah. get out of the woods. I don't have to get taken out by a by a uh, helicopter or whatever. So I just took off my bike shoes, walked barefooted out of there, got to the emergency room, and everything was good. But then I had a concussion for a few weeks. It wasn't a bad one, but it was enough where it was like, uh, yeah, just take it easy. Don't teach for, you know, I didn't teach for a week or so. And then when I got out there, I'm like, okay, I'm going to just stand around. You let other people do demonstrating and all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, those things. And I can't imagine when stuff like that happens when, you know, that was it's actually my career, too. So it's similar to a hockey player, although I can still go out there and stand around. Hockey players know they can't. And so that injury can cause some panic um, and some, you know, just wild uh 
leaps at what you think you need to compensate for. And it takes a while to settle your brain back down and just get with the business of rehabbing. And you start to learn, hey, this is all I can do is just rehab. This is the best I can do for myself, for my career, for everything is just get this rehab right and all of that. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. And I I think that's is that what you were getting at with that question? That's kind of the way I heard it anyway. Yeah, no, exactly. just, yeah, like a wall comes up and it's exactly, put it in the simplest terms. When you're, if it if it's an injury or whatever it is, you got to go small and you got to go simple. This is all I right. can do today. That's yeah. going to gonna move the needle forward as much as I can. Believe it or not, I just, I just, uh, I mean, I might have to have shoulder surgery. I do a Ouch. bunch of drills where I sit in a chair during lessons and I bounce pucks off the ground and then they got to whack it out of the air, stop it with their stick, whatever. And I'm, I'm bouncing a puck and I've done it for years and all of a sudden I bounced it and I felt a pop, heard a pop and in my shoulder and I'm in pain and the mom goes, are you all right, coach? And I'm like, no, I think coach took some shrapnel. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Exactly. <laughs> so, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, it's you're a hockey player until you know you're not, and you're you're an instructor until you can't do it anymore, and it stinks. But uh, yeah, I, I I guess that it was the thing is you know um, when these walls come up, it's recognize the the feelings. Or the you know the thoughts that you're having, know that you're not in an island, that it's completely normal, and then sure. like you just suggested, like you implement, just go small and uh, you know what's the what's the thing that I can do today to get me closer to where I get back on the ice again. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. It's kind of interesting too because I know you're running this whole thing, this whole talk we're having, but that's that's actually the same way that that even if you're not hurt, that's the same way that you approach everything really is you take, you, you break it down to the smallest possible step, the smallest possible rule and you work it. You just kind of work it. You know, it's like, I need, I need a little more of this thing, right? It's like, okay, well you need this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing, but you can only work on this one right now. And you're going to give it all you got. And you're going to you're going to try and see, like, especially with young kids, you're going to try and, you know, if I was a parent or a coach of a small, you know, eight year old kid who's never done anything like this, I would want to break this down to the smallest possible rule, because, you know, with little kids, there are rules they must follow. Like the, the whole thing as a parent or a coach is you're trying to teach your kids to not do things that make you hate them or make you resent them. And I know that's a funny statement, but it's so true. (laughs) You're trying to make your kids, because if you're, if he's bothering you, he's going to bother others too. If he's not paying attention to, to the family, he's not going to pay attention to the team. And so as a little, as a lot of little kid, he's supposed to know that you're not, trying to just improve yourself you're trying to improve your team and they're counting on you to do that they're trusting that when it when it comes to your role in the safe forecheck that you're going to do that job it's like well i'm not fast enough it's like well then what's your job then it's like to get faster like you have to get because you're letting your teammates down right like i'm on a line with some guy and i always have to take his guy i'm going to start to resent him I'm going to start hating him. It's like, well, Barry, that's not, that's not very Christian like. And it's like, no, but it's real. Yeah. Right. It's real. I mean, that kind of stuff happens and, and you only get so many chances to make up for that. And so it, it, and it's like, and then all of a sudden you go to the coach and you say, I can't play with this guy anymore. He's like, I'm wide open and he can't see me. And the coach is like in his head going, yeah, I know. I sort of regret taking him. That's resentment. And that kind of thing builds. And so you're trying to teach your kid that it's not just about you, right? It's not, you're not learning to stick handle because of you, because if it's a selfish thing, you're going to do it when you want to, and you're not going to do it when you don't want to. If it's about somebody else, you're going to do it when you don't want to once in a while too, 
right? And you're going to put some effort into it that way. And so, yeah, it's the same thing. You're breaking things down into little things. And then, you know, there's the whole, uh, what do you call it, spectrum of kids and how much they can handle as far as a, an assignment and and uh, trying to get on top of it. How much can that kid do and how much can't he do? And, you know, I have a bunch of kids on the ice and I can't give everybody the same homework. I'll drive some kids right out of hockey with some of the homework that some of the kids can pull off because they have a little bit more of a disagreeable nature. They can do something uncomfortable and they've been trained to do something uncomfortable on a regular basis enough where they've seen positive outcome and they got that dopaminergic uh, circuit going. So they're willing to put up with things that other kids can't put up with because they're a little bit more emotionally dysregulated and haven't had that disagreeable training when they're young. So if you haven't had that disagreeable training or, you know, guidance from parents, teachers, whatever, um, how can a, a kid improve on that? You know, what, what can they do on their own if they're not going to get that guidance from the, the influence and the influences in their life at the time right now? Well, that's a tough one because if it's a, if it's a young kid, it's not going to work. He's not going to be able to pull that off. He doesn't have those skills. He can't plan. He can't schedule. He can't do anything. Um, and even, even the most, uh, the most, uh, aggressive practicers can't do anything on a regular basis and will also stay away from weakness. A lot of times, like you'll see a kid go, Oh, I took a thousand shots. I go, how many backhands? 13. So your backhand sucks, right? And you don't like doing it. So it's that kind of thing. And yeah. I, it's not what I say to the kid, but it's like for that kid, even though he's highly motivated, he may still have some things he's staying away from because he's maybe he's a really good skater and he doesn't have to stick handle much and he get shots and score. And then when everybody else gets fast, he can't function, you know, because he hasn't learned all the stuff that you teach him. Right. And so he can't uh, he can't function in a crowd. He can't function uh, with his eyes up. He can't he, you know, he can't function. And so you see kind of stuff like that. And it's it's a complicated thing. But you have to kind of know what you're working with. And a lot of it is experience, but a lot of it is just, uh, you know, like for a parent, like I think about it from a parent standpoint, because parents do have to be engaged somewhat and you have to do it in a way that doesn't uh, ruin the kid. And so like we just try and we talk like I've had kids, um, I've had kids with two minutes of stick handling, uh, stick handling, uh, practice a day, two minutes, because I, I figured that's all they're going to do. They can't yeah. do it. And if I involve more of that, you're going to be involving a parent who doesn't know how to get a kid through uh, disagreeable training without making it tyrannical and arduous and a bad situation. So you're actually teaching the parent that too. And so like, you know, they'll be doing some little eyes up thing like, hey, I want you to read for I want you to read closed captioning while you're stick handling a ball for 10 seconds, eight times. <laughs> OK, so they're yeah. just going to go eight times. And it's like and I'll and I'll tell the parent, I go, hey, have him set his back, have him have a stick and a ball by where he puts his backpack home when he gets home from school. If he's got to go to the bathroom, he has to stick handle first. If his arm is broken, he has to stick handle first before he goes to the emergency room. That's all you say. And, it, and it's <laughs> like, and all you got to do is have him do it. And it, it'll be a little bit of pulling teeth, a little bit. And I tell parents, I'm going, just let him fail. Let him fail. He still has to do the eight. 10 second things or the four 10 second things. I don't care how long it is. As long as he does something that's sustainable that he can do every day and about 10 days in, he's going to have already, he's going to have a little bit of neuron development where it's much easier to do. And he might just sit there for 20 seconds and do it right. And, uh, and get, and get done sooner or whatever. But then the parent's going to go, wow, Wow, that's pretty good. Okay. Dopamine surge. Now the kid feels good. He feels, 
He's got some meaning. There's some meaning to all of what just happened, right? So, and dopamine, to the molecule for dopamine turns into adrenaline. So when a kid recognizes that he achieved something better than him, he gets energy from that, the good feeling, and then energy to want to do it more. I mean, that's what we live on. We live, we move because of adrenaline. We always think of it as some thing that snaps out when we get scared and everything, but it's no, it's, it's always continually uh, released, right? And you want to have those kind of releases. That's what, uh, that's what disagreeable training does. And it literally starts between two and four years old. And so if you have these kids that get really emotionally dysregulated about doing things and everything, it wasn't very complete there. And that's literally 85% of the population, right? There's going to be yeah. some problems there. And so you, you're really starting the parent and the kid off with baby steps. You're rehabbing them in a sense, right? Like what we were talking about. Take, take the smallest step, do it, do nothing else, get it done, do it right, and, uh, and make sure it's scheduled in. And, uh, you know, take the weekends off if you want to, or take two days off during the week, maybe Monday and Friday and do the weekends, you know? And it's like, so we start with that. And then once they do that, now they're ready for other things because the kid, like, cause I'll recognize if they pull it off or not, you know, I'll, I'll see it within two weeks. I'll see this kid is way better, like way better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then we want to start giving him, you know, the ability to keep his eyes up in chaos and that gets that gets a little bit more difficult but they already have the basics so they they end up going through the next steps much quicker so that's that's basically what that is if you take a step too far you can hinder their their ability and their desire if you if you don't go far enough they don't improve they don't improve so going far enough means you're taking this step that is beyond them but just enough beyond them where they feel like they can possibly reach it. And when, that's different with everybody. But uh, I mean, I've seen kids that were emotional little wrecks when they were young and they're playing college hockey and they kind of got their shit together now. Yeah. So it's, it, and I can't say that's all me, but I think I might've had a piece of that, maybe an inspiration for them to want to do it more and more. And maybe the parents even got better. So that's, yeah. that's, I love that. That's, that's actually, I, I, that, that's the thing I will miss more than anything that has to do. I, I don't, I, it, that's more important to me than working with pro teams, college kids, all that kind of stuff. That, that is nothing compared to seeing that kind of thing light a kid up. That's the best. That is, um, <laughs> Again, thank you. I'm getting my Barry Karn fix on here, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't you too, huh? Um, I feel like a drug. <laughs> you, you are. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is for coaches. Uh, I think this ties in perfectly out there. Uh, teachers that are out there. Um, there's you talk about that ad, that adre adrenaline hit that they get when they. You know, know that okay. I I understand the process now. I'm gonna you know have some struggle, but then I I get a little you know uh, adrenaline hit when I accomplish it. So from a coaching standpoint, before they get to that point where they get the feel goods, uh, they fall, they fail, all these things. Coaches, what we say to that kid during those moments are are really important and you know no is not an answer no no you know they fall down no not not, not like that no that's that's what they hear all the time so you know I, I try to not use that word but you know if they're coming like excellent or if they're doing a, a shot and they uh step with the wrong foot i'll say shot was op awesome let's try it stepping with the other foot so yeah what, what are some techniques phrases that uh you and jody uh have come up with to to really just create that that learning environment where failure is just you know something that we don't even think about it's a good thing yeah i, I guess uh, something comes to mind uh i remember teaching some young kids they were like they were mites okay they're little kids and i had this little drill where they skated around behind the net and as soon as the puck 
you know, cleared the net to throw up a pass to the wing, we wanted them to throw it. We didn't, we didn't want them to skate five more strides before they threw it to the pass and threw it to guy and drag a four track checker over there with them. Right. So it, it was one of those things. And I had this kid, I remember it night as day because it made light bulbs go off with me when, when this was a long time ago, early in my coaching, he went around the cone and I saw him get his head up. Cause we had already working on, we were already working on some eyes, you know, skating through cones and looking at me while I'm holding numbers up with my fingers and whatever. And so I said, okay, I want you to keep your eyes or, you know, keep looking over here to see if that guy's going to be open. And as soon as you're open, you fire the pass and he got open. I could see his eyes were up through the pass, wiped out both his gloves fell off his stick, everything. And, and my, my reaction was, I saw you get your eyes up sweet. And so you don't pay attention to the fall, the wipeout or anything. You find the little things that kids do that are an attempt towards the goal. You know, and like you said, hey, you did this on this one foot. How about the other foot? It, it's the same thing. Now you're on that foot. It looks like you could glide on your outside edge for about three feet. You think you could pull off five feet? You know, it's stuff like that. And it's like, and it's and it's it sometimes you just have to ignore it a few times because if that kid isn't that brave and he keeps failing and he keeps hearing about it, why would I want to be brave about that? Where all I'm going to do is get complaints, right? I mean, that's what's going on in the kid's head. He doesn't know the end result of all this hard stuff you're having him do. He's going to know the end result of it when he can do it, right? But he doesn't know it now. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to get kids just brave about trying little things and praise them for trying it. You know, I have kids wiping out all the time, like I have a little girl who was probably crying, didn't even want to come out on the ice. And by the time the hour's over, you know, she wipes, you know, she'll wipe out and and it's like, God, you're pretty brave, you know, that kind of thing. And you have kind of fun, you know, this little, little girl. And she's like, okay, I'm not afraid of this big man anymore. And all of that kind of stuff. And it's like, that's what it's about. It's about their little psyches, you know. And we're trying to get them to play hockey players and be hockey players. And they don't have no idea even how to stand on an outside edge yet. So we're we're just trying to teach them some bravery stuff and get some sort of little dopaminergic circuit going with them with what the other five or six little kids are trying to like I think about Jody when she's teaching all these little tiny kids and I'm like she's got this little group of kids and and it's uh it's pretty funny she's uh she's a great motivator of little kids it's like having grandma on the ice with the kids they're not intimidated by her at all but I think she's actually a little bit more of a drill sergeant than I am and they it, and but but she they, it's all done with a smile like these kids are doing stuff they have no idea that they're even trying to to do it which is kind of a cool uh it's kind of a cool thing but it's also you know we'll tell kids even young kids I'll tell them if you're ever nervous or if you have some anxiety or you're scared it's cuz you're missing some information and I'm about to give you a bunch of information here OK, right. First information is we have to stand on an outside edge and you're going to be nervous and scared. Who's brave enough to do it? And they should put their hands up. And it's like, OK, that's it. Good to try it. And I go, three of you are going to die. And then they laugh. You know, it's like, yeah, that's not going to be that bad. Right. <laughs> and so it's that kind of thing. And and it's like that's that's the, it's the psyche of the little kid who has no idea what you're trying to accomplish with them at all. Not a clue. Got one more question for you, and then I'm going to let you yeah. go. This has been fantastic. You talk about that little kid, that little group of kids that are out there with you and Jody. Uh, they get their uh, skates off. They run upstairs. They get in the car. Mom and Dad says, how was your skate with the Carnes this morning? What do you hope they say? I hope they tell a stupid joke that I told them. <laughs> that's what I hope. I mean, especially if it's a little tiny kid, you know, like you tell, you tell them a stupid joke and you're done. You go, you guys don't forget to tell this joke to your parents. There you okay. Go. And then, oh, you know, it's just, it, it's about, it's about, 
not not just that they don't know what's going on because they did and they'll they'll probably say yeah that was fun and blah 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 that's i hope they say that i hope they they learned something really hard and left and said that was really fun i like mr karn i like mrs karn this is fun i like to do this and i love to hear when someone says my son woke me up this morning with all his stuff on to go to a 6.30 lesson in the morning. It's like, okay, cool, man. That makes me feel great. You know, and it just keeps me, it's like, wait a minute. All these other kids didn't say that. I got to I gotta get my act together. Yeah. To really want to be here. And it's that kind of thing. So it's like, yeah, those little kids, I, I'd, like them to, I'd like them to feel like it's okay to be a little kid too. You know, like when you, t- you know, you, t- you tell some kid you're talking and you go, Hey, don't touch your puck when the coach is talking and they look at you and it's like, you know why he goes, cause, and I just go, they're going to hate you. They're just going to hate you. They're going to be talking and you're going to be playing with the puck and they're just going to hate you. And I'll say that with a smile and they kind of laugh, but they know it's true. They know they're being irritating. And, and I can, and I'll ask them, do you think anybody had to, tell me that. And I'm going, are you kidding me? Hundreds of times I got in trouble. Okay. Like someone would say, Karn, quit screwing around. And I would tell them because I see squirrels, right? You know, that kind of thing. And with little kids and I have these little, these little silicone squirrels, they're about a half inch tall. And I give them to people that see squirrels, right? So (laughs) I give them, and, and it's just a reminder for them, but it's a fun reminder. And it's a little thing that could sit on a glass. And I have kids that their parents go, God, he's got a squirrel on his dinner glass every day, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so it's, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically what it is. I want kids to say I had fun, but I want the parents to, to look back and go, wow, he learned something today. And all he's doing is telling me a joke and saying he had fun. Spring breaks coming up for everyone. Um, after that, everyone is going to be planning if they haven't already, what they're going to be doing for uh, when they get back and for the summer. If they want to learn more about uh, you guys, where should I send them? Uh, KarnSkatingDynamics.com. And that's, you know, that's where all of our information is about how to get involved and all of that kind of stuff. We are we're very busy that it's, uh, you know, we, we get filled to capacity every year. And so things fill up fast, but don't uh, don't be afraid to get on a waiting list if there's a waiting list for your age kid, because it's amazing how much things change, you know, because there'll be there'll be kids that just all of a sudden something comes up. Dad gets a new job and they move, you know, or whatever by the time. And, and a lot of that stuff, you know, it's not spring break when they get back that people fill up. It starts filling up with us in January when we open it up. Yeah. And gets pretty full, but you know we we teach during the year too. So during the summertime, kids sign up for a, a one morning a week. The older high school, college, and pro guys they're twice a week, and then uh, <clears throat> during the school year, we're on the ice at five different rinks around the metro area on different days, and we're there from six to nine, and they're half hour lessons. So. That's so we don't get an overload of information or burn kids out, but they still get a great lesson that they can take this one little element. And then every time they get on the ice with their team, we tell them, get out on the ice right away when the Zamboni's done. And you're going to have about two minutes and you're probably still going to have a little time to screw around with your buddies. But do this thing. We'll give them some little, little developmental element that they'll just do that's really small, really short, small amount of time. And it gets them teaching themselves how to coach themselves, right? How to go go through the things. And, uh, you know, like that. And we can always refer to that kind of stuff during lessons, too. It's like, it doesn't look like you're doing this, okay? Or maybe it's just really hard for you. Whichever it is, is totally up to you. But it doesn't look like it's working yet. <laughs> you know, so that's the way we, that's the way we put it. So they got, they have nothing but personal responsibility left. It's that kind of thing. Fantastico. Well, Mr. Kern, um, my feel-good energy reserve is topped off. I can't take any more. 
So thank you for that. Um, anything else we got to get out into the uh, universe right now? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that, I think, you know, it, it's, you're always, uh, when I talk to you, we're always talking about me and all my stuff. And I just, I just really appreciate when I get kids that know how to handle a puck because we got a lot of, we have a lot of uh, vision work that we do with kids looking in all kinds of different directions while skating in all kinds of different directions, trying to discern what's going on over their back while they're actually doing something active um, with their stick. And when we get kids from me, cause I can ask them right away. I go, oh my God, you know, the guy, the guy is going to learn it. I don't want to say 10 times faster. I want to say 20 times faster because he's already becoming one with his stick and has such a good feel for the puck that he doesn't really need to keep looking and checking it. He can start looking around globally, as we say, or see the whole fish bowl for that fish that wants to bite his tail off while he's still looking around for teammates with the puck. And that's you, Lance. I mean, it's like we just don't see kids like that unless they've had that kind of comprehensive training systematically working on all kinds of wrist movements and hanging on to the puck. And, and it, so anyway, I just got to thank you. It makes me look like a genius. So well, that's great. Well, thank you. I, I wasn't expecting that little uh, cherry on the top, but I appreciate it. <laughs> um, You're the best. Well, you, you are as well. And it, it's uh, still a continued fun journey. I love getting up in the morning as I know you do as well. So um, thank you again for taking the time. I know that this is going to be another very well received uh, episode and you're our number one guy. You've been on the, the Hockey Journey podcast more than anyone else. So um, I hope it's not like, you know, drills that I, you know, challenge drills that I have here. Uh, you know, Kids come in, they're like, all right, what's the challenge, Joe? What's the record? All right, I'm going to go after that until I get it. Yeah, uh, yeah for sure. So, all right, buddy. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I but, love it. I love it. Love talking to you. It's just good stuff. Perfect. Well, you guys, uh, I don't know if you're going on uh, spring break anywhere, but if you are, uh, get some. Oh, no, you guys just got back, didn't you? You were down in Florida. Yeah, we, yeah, we were down in, we were actually down in uh, Tubac at the Tin Cup Golf Course. It's oh, fun. Uh, yeah, awesome. hanging out down there with wild horses on the course. Good for you. <laughs> it's a sight to behold. Yeah, well, we're getting into our uh, our busy season here pretty soon. So um, thanks for all you do. And as always, if there's you need anything, uh, if I can help out with what you guys got going on, let me know. But um, until our paths crossed again, Barry, and tell Jody, there's, we can just talk about like her favorite recipes. I'd love to have your wife on the show. That okay. would be that's that's how we're gonna trick her. Whatever, whatever she feels comfortable that's, with, okay? No, that's great. Yeah, she was. This is this is kind of like this period of time. My daughter and my wife, they just uh, put their nose to the grindstone and take. I think they had seventy emails they had to do today. So oh, it's wow. like she just didn't couldn't do it. There's just a ton of stuff going on with all the registration stuff. So. Yeah, so she couldn't do it, but she's close. She's close. I'm talking to her. She just like gets so nervous about things like this. And she's just such a wealth of information with with dealing with little kids that I just think it's it it'll it'll just be great. It'll just be I think people will really love listening to her because she's such a positive, fun she's just a fun person to be around. So yeah. Well, good. Keep four checking her, please. Uh yeah, for I, sure. I know that there's a you know a lot of uh, players that I work with, and I was saying, hey, there's a chance. Uh, so that would be awesome. All right, my cool. friend, you uh, have All a right. great rest of your day. Thank you, and I will uh, be in touch. All right, sounds good. Take care, brother. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with one of my faves, Barry Karn. If you're in Minnesota and looking for some technical skating guidance, all I have to say is Karn Skating Dynamics. I'll put the link to their site in the description. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. 
It will really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.